احسنت بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم لا حول ولا قوة الا بالله العلی العظیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلی الله علی سیدنا و نبینا ابوالقاسم المصطفى محمد و آله طیبین الطاهرین لا سیما بقیه الله فی الارضین عجل الله تعالی فرجه الشریف و جعلنا من اعوانه و انصاره It's very happy and blessed opportunity and occasion for me to meet you especially in the night of Arafah and I hope inshallah whatever I'm going to share with you would be beneficial for preparation for the night and the day of Arafah and for appreciation of the gift of dua one of the greatest gifts of Allah to us is the fact that we can call him whenever and wherever we want this is great blessing this is great <coughs> grace of Allah that he allows us to call him even people that are very kind and very generous with their time they may not be happy that you call them anytime for anything maybe they say you can call me when there is emergency or you can call me for things that you cannot find any other source or you know you cannot you know do anything for it don't ask me for little things but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you can call me for everything from salt of your food up to high ranks in heaven you can ask me for anything so we thank Allah for this blessing of dua and also we thank him for the great heritage that we have received from Ahlul Bayt alayhim uh, so we know what to ask and how to ask it's not just we are to, you know told to pray we know what are the things that we can ask what options are there what are the things which are available and what's the um, manner and etiquette for asking so we are grateful to Allah for that uh, inshallah what I'm going to share with you is about <coughs> the mechanism of dua how dua works and then about the fact that the dua should be combined with our own work and efforts can you can you hear me yes yes, yes all of them. okay very good so first what's the mechanism of dua uh, we know that everything in this world comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this world and the way it functions is that he is providing every creature with all the good things they need I put it in two premises, the summary of this discussion. One, Allah is the only source for everything good. Existence, guidance, love, forgiveness, whatever you can think of it, which is good, comes from Him. Number two, 
Only good comes from him. So, he is the source and the soul, the only source for good things. Number two, he is the source which is pure. Nothing bad can come from him. These two look very simple, but if you really absorb these two things, your understanding of God will change. So, if there is anything that I like, I desire, I know it comes from him. If there is any problem, I know it doesn't come from him. So, there is no way that any harm, any injustice, any darkness, any impurity, anything bad comes from him. It's impossible. So, if we have problems in our life, we should know that this problem is not coming from God. For example, I don't receive enough respect or love from my friends, from my relatives, my community, for example. I don't have you know, enough income, etc. These problems don't come from God. What comes from God or from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only good things. But there is a network of channels that determine how much we receive. Sometimes these channels for certain good things can be totally blocked. You don't receive. Imagine if someone is deprived of knowledge and guidance and he is or she is totally mustad'af al cannot receive, you know, guidance, does it mean that God is not wanting him to be guided? God is sending him misguidance or ignorance, na'uzu billah? No. God wants guidance and is available to send guidance to every creature. As Quran says, so when he creates the package of creation includes guidance, includes love, respect, honor, dignity. But how much we receive is not determined only by how much he has or how much he wants to give. It's determined also by those things that occur between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also how much we try, how much we work to increase our capacity. So, in this world, my own actions plus actions of others plus Lots of natural factors can determine the quantity and quality of my life. For example, what my parents did, my four parents did, what my teachers have done, what my government has done, what people in the community, what other countries have done, all have some role in how much I receive from God. Sometimes they facilitate. Sometimes they just pass it on. They don't stop it. Sometimes they reduce. And sometimes they block. So there are different possibilities. That people may act. When they occur between us and God. Also I myself may do things to facilitate or may do things that even reduce or block. 
So, this is about dunya. In akhirah, what other people are doing, what, for example, natural factors are doing, have no impact. Only what you yourself have done. So that's the good news. No one is going to reduce or block what you are going to receive in the hereafter. But in dunya, it's possible. But in both worlds, what determines your felicity, your happiness, your sa'adah, your perfection, your purity is at the end your own decision. Others, even if they deprive you, cannot stop your progress. They can make it just difficult. They cannot stop you. So, in dunya, you are not the only factor, but you are the main factor for your happiness. In the hereafter, you are the only factor. Under Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the only thing that determines what you are going to have in the hereafter is you, what you have done, what you have achieved, what type of person you have become. But in dunya, there are many other factors as well, but you are the main one. Now, one of the things that Allah has planned in this network of distribution of good things and blessings, distribution of light, mercy, whatever good thing you want, one of the things that Allah has put in this system that can facilitate receiving more from him is dua. For example, if I want to receive something more than what I am going to receive from my parents, from guidance or support or whatever, or from my community or from my country, my nation, etc. One way is to work more to be more active, to be more wise in adapting to the condition and turning it into advantage for yourself. Another way which is combined is dua. Dua has that much of power that can directly connect you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran, as you know, says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذا سألك عبادي عني When my servants ask you about me Many things people may ask a messenger of God about God But the one that Allah mentions and prioritizes here is about how close he is to us. And then right after that, the fact that we can make dua. So, if my sermons ask you about me, I am near. He is so near that he doesn't say, tell them I am near. As if Allah is saying, if they ask you about me, I answer myself directly. I am close. <laughs> so he doesn't say, فَقُلْ إِنِّي قَرِيب. He says, فَإِنِّي قَرِيب. Although technically the Prophet is explaining, but Allah is saying that I am directly available to my servants. فَإِنِّي قَرِيب. So the most important thing that you, want, you need to know about God is that he is close, number one. Number two, أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ 
Whoever calls me, I answer. If they call me, when they call me, not that when they think they are calling me. Because sometimes maybe we are da'i, but we think we are calling God, but we are not calling God. It's just a lip service. But if we really call him, he answers. So he is close. And this has different aspects. He is aware of our condition. He is listening to us and watching us. And he hears and responds quickly. There is no need to wait for a report to come, you know, for example, from his agents to him. He directly understands what I am experiencing and what I am requesting in that moment. So, this is a mechanism that Allah has made that his creatures can call him and widen the channels of receiving mercy. Especially human beings, they have this ability. Existentially, all creatures are calling God. But in the way that is understandable to us, it's human beings and jinns who can decide to pray to God and call God. When we call him, we are increasing the capacity for receiving more mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is very much part of the system. This is not in conflict with wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I ask Allah to do everyday mu'jizam for me, this is not acceptable. Even when the messengers were there, they were not every day or every moment, you know, bringing mu'jiza. Because mu'jiza is to be kept to the necessary. As much as needed for guidance and for completion of hujjah, itmamul hujjah, prophets and messengers were given ability to do mu'jiza. But when it comes to dua, there is no limit. Because dua is part of the wise system, is not intervention in the sense that it's an exception. So, for everything we can pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are welcomed. We are encouraged. We are even asked to call him. This is ibadah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after saying, Ud'uni astajib lakum, then he says, Alladheena yastakbiruna an ibadati. So dua is ibadah, as we have in hadith, a dua mukhul ibadah. The core of ibadah is dua. So not only we can make dua, we are encouraged, we are urged to make dua. To the extent that Allah says, قُلْ مَا يَعْبَعُ بِكُمْ رَبِّي لَوْ لَا دُعَاؤُكُمْ If you don't make dua, what else you expect from me? What you can be given, you are given. If you make dua, then there is more room, more space for me to show more attention to you. So, dua is part of the system. And there is no limit in what we can ask. You can ask for yourself. You can ask for others. This is amazing. I can ask for others. Even without them knowing my dua can have impact. Although every person has to make their own decisions. But I can make dua for them and it has impact. Because Allah knows how to help them without replacing their free will with anything else. So they are free. For example, I have 
friends, I have relatives, I have children who are also adult. They are adults, they are responsible, they have to make their own choices. But I can pray for their guidance, for their tawfiq, for their tawbah, for their light. No problem. This doesn't remove their freedom. But by my dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates for them to receive these things. So with lesser efforts, they get more results. This is the power of dua. So my dua has impact on others. Your dua has impact on me. Your dua can have impact on future generations. Ismail and Ibrahim prayed to Allah for their progeny who would come much later. They were not yet born. Even their parents and for parents were not born. But they prayed for them and this prayer had impact. So we can pray for others. We can pray for ourselves. Actually, the prayer for others is much more appreciated because it's less selfish. Even in our religion, in our spirituality, we have to be worried about selfishness. Sometimes we bring our greediness and selfishness into faith. For example, if there is a golden opportunity, for example, you know, if it's a matter of going for Hajj or Ziyara, and only some people can go. There are people that if they allow them every year they want to go and they don't bother if other people get the chance or not. Or for example, if you go to the shrine, if there is a prime location next to the head of Imam, you want to do Turak Salat, some people keep doing Salat after Salat after Salat. They want to do you know, hundreds of Salat. They're, they don't let other people to do Turak Salat and go. So selfishness can come even to a spirituality and faith. But when you pray for others, it's less likely to be selfish. And also, it's the tongue by which you have not committed sin. Because according to the hadith, it says, you know, make dua with the tongue that you have not committed sin. Which tongue is that? The tongue that is praying for someone else. Because your friend with your tongue has not committed sin. I can make dua for my enemies. It's one of the amazing uh, things that you can do for your healing and for overcoming hostility is to pray for people who wronged you, people who harmed you or keep harming you. Of course, sometimes there is systematic uh, you know, wrongdoing. That's different. But with the friends, with the family members, Pray for them. If you pray for them, it gives you healing energy. Plus, this prayer can make them better. And therefore, your problems can be reduced. If someone has a problem, and then I curse them <laughs> instead of praying for them, the, our problem is going to increase. If you curse your child who is misbehaving, is your child going to become better? Maybe for a moment you are satisfying your anger by cursing your child or your husband or wife, you know, by cursing them. But it's not going to help that person and it's not going to help you and your relation. But praying for them helps you and helps that person and helps your relation. It's win-win. So, we can pray for anyone. We can pray for the children who are not born. We can pray for the children who are not yet mature. We can pray for the children who are mature. We can you know, make different kinds of du'a and each of them has explanation. If someone is not born, what does it mean? If someone is born but not mature, what does it mean? 
I don't want to go to details. But there is no limit in what you can pray for and whom you can pray for. This is the beauty of dua. And we learn from Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam that we should use, if not the best, at least some of the best moments of our life for dua. Not that when we are tired, when we are very fresh, we do other things, for example, but when we are tired or sleepy, or you know, when we, there is some time that we cannot do anything, we have finished our work, you know, we have gone back home and do, we have nothing else to do, then we say, okay, I make now my salat, still it's not qaza. No, we should use some of the best moments, the best places, the best mindset, when you are very happy, make dua. When you are very sad, make dua. When you are normal, make dua. Use any opportunity to make dua. Because dua is mukhul ibad. Dua is salahul mu'min. Dua is salahul anbiya. It's the weapon of the mu'min, weapon of anbiya also. Now, for the second part, dua should be combined with work because dua should originate from your will for bringing more light, more goodness to yourself and others. We said with dua we are trying to increase the capacity for receiving from God, from God, despite all the network which is there, we want to widen the channels that we receive from. So, if you are not willing to change the situation, if you are not determined to improve your dua has very little power. It's just lip service. Maybe Allah out of his love, you know, gives us reward for some of the duas that we make and we don't do that much about them. But the real power of dua is when it is mixed with sincere intention and a strong determination. If there is sincerity of intention and determination, you are doing what you can and then ask Allah for extra, this dua is very likely to be soon answered. For example, I am asking for rizq, praying for rizq or abundance of rizq. If I am just praying, and don't do anything, even I don't learn any skill, don't learn any job, don't apply for a job, don't open any business, whatever, I'm just making dua and doing nothing. This dua doesn't have that much impact because this is going then to be against the wisdom of God. This means you are asking intervention which cannot be generalized. Dua is something that can be generalized. Everyone can learn and do it without system being affected. So you have to do something and then make dua. I'm not saying then in the sense of after, but I mean these two are very important. First, equip yourself with some skills. Learn what can be done, what is useful in this time, and then make dua. Or for example, you are interested in having knowledge. A seeker of knowledge needs to find teachers, programs, books, friends to discuss with, take notes, review, memorize. Then you say, Rabbi Zedni Ilma. But if you don't do anything and just say, Rabbi Zedni Ilma, this dua has 
maybe no impact or very little. Maybe you get some rewards, I don't know, but you don't get knowledge unless you make efforts. You don't get rest unless you make. Or for example, you are ill. You cannot just say, oh Allah, please give me shifa. I don't want to go to a doctor. I don't want to take any medicine. I don't want you know, to do anything about my illness. Just you give me shifa. This is not going to work. You have to do whatever you can. You have to bring your little part and then ask Allah for more. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Abu Dhar, Adda'i bi ghayr al-amal the one who makes dua without doing anything, karami bela water, is someone who throws without a string, wants to throw arrow without a string. It's not possible. You have to have the equipment ready and do your part and then make dua. So, Dua with action. If you want to do tarbiyah of your children, dua is very important, but also you have to bring your part. You have to learn. You have to ask others for advice. Make efforts, spend time, spend money. But don't forget, these are not enough. These are just preparation this is just to register to you know subscribe the main thing comes through your dua therefore my understanding is this that dua is the best action of people who work you know we say for example hayya ala khayr al amal salat is a kind of dua why salat is khayr al amal because the best thing that a wise and active believer can do is salat, is dua in this special form. But if you don't do other things and just make salat, this is not khayrul amal. If someone doesn't do anything and just makes salat, this is not khayrul amal. It's khayrul amal if you have actions which are amal salih, but we know that what you get through your salat is more. What you get through your dua is more. So, I go for learning. I go to Jose, to university, whatever, to take lessons. I study, I do mubahisa, all these things. But I know knowledge comes from Allah. Al-ilmunurun yaqzifuhullah fi qalb man yasha. So, my trust is not in my efforts. My trust is in Allah. And the way to release that is dua. I make lots of efforts, for example, maybe for upbringing of my children. But I should not rely on my efforts. And if, inshallah, I have good children, I should not say it was my efforts. No. If anything helped you, was your du'as, your tawassul, your request. But Allah took your du'a seriously because you did what you could. You brought your part. You were not lazy. You were not someone who thinks that, you know, everything happens, you know, just randomly, by luck, by chance. You knew this world is based on calculation on measure. Everything, everything has a scale. If you observe it, you can succeed. If you don't observe it, you will fail. So, this is what I thought it's good to share with you for tonight. I hope, inshallah, we can better appreciate the blessing of dua and the du'as that we have received from Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam. And we humbly ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to answer du'as of all people who call him. 
If Allah accepts dua of any person, any servant of him, we should be grateful. And in particular, we ask Allah to accept and answer the duas of people who suffer. People who are ill, people who are poor, people who are suffering from loneliness, people who suffer from injustice, from war. And we particularly pray for our brothers and sisters in Palestine. And we request Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect them and protect their dignity and their honor and their rights for peaceful and just and dignified life, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alam. Thank you very much, Azhar. Very, very inspiring. Very uh, if you have time, can we have some questions? Yes. Yes, inshallah. Ten minutes, inshallah. Yes, I'll say it below. Alaikum wa rahmatullah. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Our question for you is that what's the difference between talking to Allah and Dua? Ah, so we say, yeah, we have two different things. We should talk to Allah and then we have a talk. So what's the difference in our views? Yes, very good. Very good. Exactly. May Allah bless. Dua in essence means to call Allah. But most of the time our duas involve some hajat, some requests. So if you want to be very specific we say, dua receives ajaba and su'al receives a'ta. In hadith of Qurban Nawafil, we have about the people that they become very close to Allah. In da'ani ajabtuhu wa in sa'alani a'taytuhu. If he calls me, I will answer and if he asks me, I will grant. So, if you say, Ya Allah, this is dua. But 99% when we say, Ya Allah, after that we ask for something. <laughs> because we are very much needy and very much, you know, surrounded with lots of hajat. But it's very good if we sometimes just call him without asking. And let him decide. You know, like, you know, if someone comes and says, Salam, and then says, you know, give me this. Another time says, Salam, give me this. You know, your heart will be broken. You never say salam without asking anything. So I wonder if you didn't need anything, you would have come to me or not. So it's good that sometimes we just call him and we don't ask anything. We just call him and say we are grateful. We are thankful. We love you. Any other question from sisters? Uh, you can come to Amr Shabbat, yeah? Sister Santina? Yes. If you can come closer. Yes. So we have, uh, for the time being, two more questions. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. sister. How are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm good. How are you? Thank you very much. May Allah bless you, inshallah. Yeah. So my question is, you said that the duas are answered quickly. Um, is there a measure of this? Is it is it uh, reflective of people's um, uh, closeness with Allah? Does is there some criteria for this? Because you said it seemed to be like a general thing. However, we know that there is delay in dua. Lots yeah. of people say that my dua is answered. Then you find some people who say my dua is answered very quickly. I wonder if you could just elaborate. Thank you. So. Uh, Allah quickly answers, so He is Sari al Ajaba. He is the one who quickly answers. So as soon as you say, Ya Allah, He says, Labbaik. He says, Here I am. But 
when it comes to granting what you request, it depends. He may give it quickly. He may give it later. Or he may find this is not maslaha and replaces it with something better. Always he would replace it with something better. If he is not finding it maslaha of you or general maslaha to give something, he gives you something better. Therefore, people on the day of judgment, when they see what Allah has given them for the du'as which were not answered in dunya. This is not du'a for iman or you know, this, this is normally hajat that we have in dunya. When they see what Allah gives them for those du'as which were not answered, they wish none of their du'as were answered. Your du'as are saved for you and replied by Allah and granted with things which are better. So we should never be hopeless. If what we are asking for is really good, if Allah finds it in our maslaha, he will give it quickly or later or he will give something better. You are not going to lose. Even if you repeated something hundred times, do it hundred one times. Because every time also counts. For every extra time you make dua, you will get something. So don't stop making dua. Uh, yeah. Brother Mushtaba, come quickly and then Brother Mustafa. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykhana. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah. Shaykhana, one time I heard a lecture from, you, from yourself and you said that the awliya Allah of Allah they feel that they don't need to ask or they feel ashamed to ask for things from Allah because Allah would grant them, you know, give it to them anyways. And that sometimes they, they might just do dua because they want to show their faqar, the support of Allah But then we read this, that there are things or blessings Allah would never give to a person unless he makes a dua, unless he asks for it. So how can these two uh, go together? Along, you know, go together? Yeah. So, awliyaullah are sometimes grow, going through stages in their spiritual journey. They are not all, always like infallible uh, imams or the prophet. So, awliyaullah at some point in their spiritual journey, they feel very embarrassed to ask for anything more. They are full of appreciation of what they have been given. They think they cannot thank Allah enough for the things that have been given. And therefore, instead of asking for something more, they try to focus more on being grateful. But this stage can also lead to other stages that you are able to be grateful and humble and still ask for something more without any expectation in the sense that you must give me. If you don't give me, you know, you are not good enough or kind enough. Ahlul Bayt, because they have completed the journey, so they are very good role models for us that despite them being very pleased with Allah's decisions, still they make du'as. But even in Ahlul Bayt, du'as and munajat, sometimes there may be things that can suit different stations. Okay? Uh, so this is why we need, you know, some spiritual mentors to tell us, for example, which zikr you should tell more. Which, you know, another person should say more. But generally speaking, it's always good to ask for, you know, people like us. Ask Allah. But prioritize things which are for akhirah and iman and spirituality over worldly things. Even if you ask worldly things, no problem. But prioritize those spiritual things. Number two, Always with the spirit of thankfulness. 
not with the spirit of nagging and complaining. So I am very grateful for what you have done and given me. If it is possible, please give me this. And also I want this for other people. I'm not only wanting for myself. Please grant other people as well. If this is with this spirit, this is good. Uh, from the before we go to the last question, no one comes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Alam ya, ya dada. Ba. Ya. Alaykum assalam. I just wanted to ask. You mentioned about um, only goodness comes from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Yes. Um, so when we get a test from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, does that you just mean that we need to see the goodness? Or, I mean, people might perceive that as being, you know, bad, something bad coming from God. Can you elaborate a little bit about Yeah, yeah. That Very good. You know, everything is a test, but it doesn't mean that Allah has brought it to me, necessarily. You know, imagine you are a driving instructor. Okay? You take your trainee to the city. Then a careless driver, okay, just comes from another line to your line and creates a hazard. For you, this is a good time to test your trainee. How does he or she react? Okay? Did you plan this? Did you ask that person, you know, I give you some money that at this moment you come, you know, in front of my, you know, car and, you know, uh, I want to see my, how my trainee works or reacts? No. So, if I do something good to you, it's a test for you. If I do something bad to you, it's also a test. In other words, because we are free, every choice we make, every decision we make is a test. So all our life is test, but it doesn't mean that Allah is bringing bad things to me. He tests me, but not by bringing bad things to me. Uh, if you allow the last question, yes. is that okay? Yes, the last. Uh, yeah, the last question. Alaykum as wa rahmatullah. Uh, my question revolves around... Um, doing dua through Ahlul Bayt. So, for example, we go to the shrine of Amir Mu'mineen or yeah. Abba Abdullah and say, Ya Abba Abdullah, give me X, Y, Z. So, some of the students uh, asking, does it ha happen through a mediator? Does, you know, Abba Abdullah go to Rabbil Alameen and say, give this Abid uh, something or does Allah listen to what we're saying but through yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. So we know that everything comes from Allah. So if Abu Abdullah is going to give me something or Imam Zaman is going to give me something, they are not independent. So it means they ask Allah to give or Allah has given them already permission to give. But the real giver is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can say, Allah, please give me because of Abu Abdullah or you can say oh, Abu Abdullah please give me which means please with the permission that Allah has given you give me what I want and even Abu Abdullah in this time of course technically do it does it through Imam Mahdi because in this time Hujja of Allah is Imam Mahdi and everyone else sh should you know be known that they are operating through Imam Mahdi. But at the end, this is the whole system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who gives, but he loves also to make dua and he loves also to refer to these people so that our relation with them increases and we learn from them. So when I go for ziyara or I do tawassul or I ask for shafa, it's all to become more similar to them. Imam Khomeini has a beautiful discussion in Adab al-Salat. He says, Shafa'a works because there is 
similarity created in the life between you and the one who is going to intercede. Okay, may Allah inshallah bless all of you and Iltimasa do'a please.